On our broadcast tonight, South Korea takes up North Korea on its offer to hold reunions for families separated by the Korean War and block off six days in mid-February to do it. Will joint South Korea-U.S. military drill derail the easing tensions on the peninsula? South Korean lawmakers get proactive following one of the largest ever personal and financial data leaks in the nation's history. A revision to the Personal Information Protection Act may be coming as soon as next month. Korean shares close 1.5% lower as signs of slowing growth in China and a plunge in emerging market assets stoke concerns that money may be pulled out of the region. For these and more, stay with us for Early Edition at 6. It is 11 a.m. in Damascus, 2.30 p.m. in New Delhi, and 6 on a Monday evening here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gon Young. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Daniel Cha. Now, amid a more amicable atmosphere, South Korea has proposed a day for reunions of families separated since the Korean War and is currently waiting for North Korea's response. And while that seems as well and good, North Korea's reaction to upcoming joint military drills between Seoul and Washington could throw a monkey wrench in the plans. Our Hwang Sung-hee starts us off. Families separated since the Korean War will have the chance to see each other again in mid-February if North Korea agrees to South Korea's offer made on Monday. Considering the wishes of the separated families, we proposed holding a round of family reunions at Mount Kungangsan Resort from February 17th to the 22nd for six days. This follows Pyongyang's surprise proposal on Friday that the reunions resume at a convenient time for Seoul after the Lunar New Year holiday, which falls at the end of this week. South Korea's unification ministry said the proposed dates are flexible and asked to hold working-level talks on Wednesday at the Truce village of Panmunjom to fine-tune the details. Pyongyang may want a later date, sometime after the joint military drills between Seoul and Washington, which begin at the end of February. Despite North Korea's repeated calls to cancel what it views as war games, South Korea made clear that the humanitarian event and the military training exercises are two separate matters. When we selected the date, we considered the preparation process at Mount Kungang and the urgency of the issue of family reunions. Joint military drills between South Korea and the U.S. were not considered. Millions of Koreans were separated from their loved ones when the country was divided more than six decades ago. Around 72,000 South Koreans are on a waiting list for a chance to meet their families one last time. But it's been three years now since the last reunions. If the event takes place next month, a hundred divided family members from each side who are selected for last year's cancelled reunions will meet with their loved ones. However, a handful of these aging relatives have fallen ill since then, underscoring the urgency of resuming the long-suspended reunions. Hwang sang Arirang News. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is likely to visit Seoul and Beijing next month, ahead of President Barack Obama's tour of Northeast Asia. Now, Kerry is expected to discuss North Korea during this trip, along with the uh, territorial and historical issues that have riled up tensions in the region in recent months. While also being watched closely is whether Kerry chooses to stop over in Japan. He visited the country last April in a similar tour of Northeast Asia, but the speculation is that he may bypass Tokyo this time around. A diplomatic source says Kerry's tight schedule might preclude him from a trip to Japan. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has no intention to backtrack from controversial remarks he made last week, in part because he sees nothing wrong with them. The Prime Minister doubled down on his World War I remarks on Monday, while the new head of Japan's public broadcaster NHK has also found himself under fire for seemingly defending Japan's use of military sex slaves during World War II. Kim hyun reports. Controversial remarks by NHK's new president, Gatsuto Momi, are being met with heavy criticism. 
At his inaugural news conference on Saturday, Mumi said that women have been used as sex slaves by the militaries of many countries throughout history, not just Japan. He also criticized Korea for continuing to demand that Tokyo compensate Korean victims of sexual enslavement by the Japanese military during World War II. Japan argues the issue had been settled by a bilateral peace treaty. According to Japan's Asai Shimbun, a high-ranking executive of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party said that Momi's comfort women remarks could lead to his dismissal as NHK chairman. Observers say this also is likely to affect the Japanese parliament's budget deliberations for NHK, which are due to start in March. Momi must stand before the House of Representatives when those deliberations start, and several opposition members of parliament have expressed their intent to grill him when they do. Meanwhile, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe continues to defend his likening of current Japan-China relations to those of Britain and Germany before World War I saying that there was nothing inappropriate about what he said. While in Davos last week, Abe explained that Britain and Germany, like Japan and China today, had a strong trading relationship. Although the strategic bilateral relations did not stop the two countries from going to war in 1914. Japan has denied that Abe's comments were intended to suggest that war is inevitable. And China's foreign ministry has responded by calling the remarks inappropriate. Some say Japan's central role in the heightened tensions in Northeast Asia may play a major role in U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's decision over whether to visit Tokyo when it comes to the region next month. Kim hyun Arirang News. Now, in a move to curb possible follow-up crimes following the massive data leak of bank users in Korea, prosecutors say that they will detain and investigate those suspected of illegally trading personal information and will seek the maximum penalty for those found guilty. The Supreme Prosecutor's Office announced Monday that it will carry out a crackdown on all related crimes by activating over 700 investigators. The types of crimes under the microscope include voice phishing and smishing, which are financial fraud schemes using phone calls and text messages. The maximum penalty for these crimes is up to five years in prison or up to about 46,000 U.S. dollars in fines. Count President Park Geun-hye among the millions of Koreans up in arms about the recent theft and leak of personal data. The president didn't mince words on Monday, saying she would personally see to it that anyone who is proven to have been involved is held responsible. Our presidential office correspondent Oh Jin-ju has this report. President Park is firm about holding those involved in the massive data leak of 20 million bank and credit card users responsible. 이번에 문제가 된 세계 카드사 유예에 다른 회사에서는 개인정보 유출이 없었는지 전 금융회사를 대상으로 철저히 조사를 하고. Meeting with her top secretaries on Monday, the president described the leak as, quote, something that should have never happened and ordered officials to devise measures to ensure that customers do not suffer when financial firms collect and store personal data. She also urged those firms to find other ways to identify individuals, rather than relying solely on resident registration numbers, which are widely used in Korea. Other options, she says, could include the use of driver's license numbers. President Park also slammed Deputy Prime Minister Hyun Oh-suk's controversial remarks last week on the data leak, seeing the only increased distrust among the public. Hen faced strong backlash from the public and politicians after saying that, quote, foolish people always try to put the blame on others when something happens, and don't we all agree with financial firms when we provide personal information? The comments came in response to questions on whether the heads of the nation's financial watchdogs will resign over the incident. <laughs> President Peck called for a swift passage of a bill on financial consumer protection at a provisional session of the National Assembly in February to prevent similar crises from happening again. Oh Jin-ju, Arirang News. 
Staying on the subject, as dust settles on one of the largest ever personal and financial data leaks in Korea's history, the country's main political parties have been rolling out their own measures to investigate the matter, and the National Assembly will revise a related law to bring the crisis under control. Our Chim Young-gil has more. In the wake of the massive data leak, Korea's National Assembly plans to pass a revision to the Personal Information Protection Act at next month's extraordinary session. The revision will form a legal framework to make mobile spam messages illegal and clamp down on voice phishing, both of which are the most common forms of financial fraud. Financial firms will also be restricted from sharing their clients' personal information with their affiliates to prevent secondary damages. The leader of the main opposition Democratic Party, Kim Ang Gil, has proposed the National Assembly form a special committee to find out how the data breaches were able to happen. Kim is also demanding government and presidential office officials step down to take responsibility for the leaks. There should be a full-scale personnel shakeup at the presidential office of Cheong Wade and the cabinet, as these leaks were brought on by President Park Geun-hye's uncommunicative politics. He also urged the ruling Senori party to accept his party's proposal of setting up a special committee to oversee a parliamentary probe into the matter. Kim said the government must determine the causes of the leaks and come up with preventive measures. However, the Senori party says it's opposed to Kim's proposal, as the matter can be handled by one of the National Assembly's standing committees. A separate parliamentary probe by a special committee is unnecessary. Our top priority is to bring the situation under control. President Park has promised to hold people accountable. At an emergency meeting with related ministers on Sunday, Prime Minister Chung Hong won ordered the establishment of a government-wide task force and to devise follow-up measures to bring the crisis under control. Ji Myung-gye, Arirang News. So Korean regulators have vowed harsh corporate penalties for data theft as angry customers have been swamping credit card offices for the past week after 20 million people had their financial information stolen. Last week's data leak was the nation's largest ever of private financial data and involved three credit card companies and at least 20 million clients out of a national population of 50 million. Right, the leak is uh, definitely a concern among Koreans as credit card usage is particularly high in this country where the average adult has uh, four to five plastic cards. So why the loophole in the system and what can be done to prevent such a leak from happening again? Well, joining us live in the studio to give us some answers to that question is Dr. Kim Bum Soo, Associate Dean of the Graduate School of Information at Seoul based Yonsei University. Professor Kim, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me here. Now, uh, Professor Kim, uh, this is obviously not the first time that such a data leak or a data breach has happened in this country. Um, how did this happen on such a large scale, and uh, why is it that such unfortunate events uh, continue to transpire? Well, um, the country has been raised the levels of security for financial institutions for, for the last several years after every instance. But still, there are problems. I mean, the culture is the problem. Management is a problem. Technology itself is a problem. And traditionally, we have focused more on technology rather than person or manage managerial issues. Now we see that the insider, the person who's working for the company, stole data from the company and tried to sell to outside. This is a very typical case of personal data theft. And this is widely happening, but it's an insider. It's very difficult to manage and pro the block them, prevent them stealing data from the company. Only way to do is better handling, having technology, technological solutions, managerial solutions, and cultures all together. And good working ethics, I suppose. Right. And then the, the CEOs and government should put priority on security and data protection. Right. It's always a tough job finding the right man for the job or a good man for the job, as mm -hmm. always. Uh, well, the government did set up a task force to overhaul the current data protection rules and toughen penalties. Uh, 
Uh, but, uh, you know, we're just talking about sticks and sticks and nothing but sticks. Uh, will this be very effective? Well, the remedies that government proposed is the remedies we have been thinking about for the long period of time. I mean, the cost of implementing these remedies is substantially high. But as a result, we were hesitating. Prof professionals and government were hesitating to implement these type of regulations on this financial industry. Well, after this serious problem and public's uh, fear of losing their personal data, I mean, government step in and change their priorities at this time. But we have to be very careful making these regulations become effective. We don't know. Sometimes this harsh regulation may put us, the credit card industry, into a bag all day. So we have to be careful, and we, have to, we need a balanced regulations. Not to get carried away with emotions at the moment right. because this is a crucial time to make necessary changes. And then the cost of all this regu regulation is eventually paid by individuals. Right, right taxpayers. <laughs> taxpayers. <laughs> right, um, and the government, the Korean government plans to eradicate uh, those uh, spam text messaging and voice phishing by the end of the year. Um, this by slapping, I suppose, bigger fines for those who have been caught and, uh, and boosting the monetary systems. Now, in your view, is that feasible? Well, this is a very tough solution. I mean, it's a tough stick they pick up. I mean, Traditionally, I, I mean, for personally, I never thought that government to, will do such, such a thing to uh, block, or to prevent other people using the stolen personal data. But government decided to do it, and this is a temporarily, this may be effective, but again, we have to be very careful not to kill good guys. Mm. Okay, so we're on a trial and error uh, phase at the moment. Right. Uh, I will miss those uh, spam messages. Some of them are quite creative. Of course, you right. don't want to click on them. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, just like uh, they say in uh, mixed martial arts, always protect yourself. Uh, and I think that is one thing we've learned this time. We can't always uh, expect someone else to do the basic uh, job, like using, doing what we can mm -hmm. to help protect our own information. So apparently right now, uh, the public is actually trying to shift all the blame on the government and other related ministries and what can be done. But of course, it all comes down to individuals. How can we change that uh, mentality? Well, the individuals often, uh, easy, it's easy to blame others, but individuals are also responsible for certain things. I mean, for spam or voice phishing. I mean, if there is a SMS message, there is a link uh, to the internet. I mean, try, of, try to avoid them. Do not click on, mm -hmm. even if it looks like it's sent from a, one of your bank you know, you've been dealing with. And if it's an email, try to install antivirus software, anti-spam software, and try to see whether it is legitimate email message from the party that you know. I mean, those are the basic steps that you have to follow. On top of that, the fa password. I mean, you have to have a smart password for your email, for your the bank account, and other things. Oh, wow. That hurts. I, I, now I know I have to wake up and get more creative with my password. An another question that I might have for you, Professor Kim, is that uh, President Park Geun-hye also herself said that there should be less of those uh, reckless personal information collecting by financial firms and whatnot. And, and to me, this personal data leakage seems to be, um, you know, it's not limited to the financial realm, but it's a really societal problem worldwide. So uh, is that possible? Are we po is it possible for us to live and carry on our lives without providing our personal information to those uh, financial firms or whatnot? Well, it's a very important question that you raised. I mean, in this information society, credit-based society, we cannot leave without personal data shared, sharing with the financial institution, government, hospitals, or educational institutions. We need to share that data. Personal data is there to share mm -hmm. first. But while you are sharing data, we often encounter problems, stalking, hacking, and, so and others. So we need to protect them properly. Financial institutions at this time have been collecting using personal data. At the same time, they are making money on it and providing service for us. And from on top of that, financial companies are responsible 
for, for protecting this personal data so that personal data is properly used so that we can again trust this financial institution and offer our personal data. That uh, trust has, to be, has been breached to a certain extent at this time. That's the worst, um, that's the, the biggest loss that we encounter at this point. Well, Dr. Kim bum Associate Dean of the Graduate School of Information at Yonsei University, thank you so much for coming in and opening our eyes and broadening our horizons on this matter. We do look forward to coming, you coming back again soon. Thank you for having me here. Thanks. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with heroes and experts to help you understand the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gun Young and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. Now, concerns over the weakening global economic recovery took a big bite out of the Korea's benchmark index on this Monday. In fact, Asian stocks across the board started off the weakened decline. Our Kim ji explains why. The sell-off in global markets turned toward Asia on Monday, with stocks across the region plunging and trading as worries grow over slowing growth in China and signs that the U.S. will ease back on stimulus measures. Shares in Seoul slumped to a five-month low to start the week. The benchmark KOSPI dropped 1.5 percent to close at 19.10 after dipping as low as 1899 at one point, as low as level since August last year. Indexes in other countries met similar fates. The MSCI Asia Pacific index dropped 1.5 percent to a 4.5 month low, while Japan's Nikkei dropped 2.5 percent to 15,000, the lowest closing level since mid November, as the yen touched a seven week high against the greenback. The declines first hit developing economies, with the currencies in Argentina, Turkey, and South Africa depreciating to new levels not seen in years. Experts attribute the sell-off from investors growing wary of tightening credit conditions in China as Beijing seeks to curb growth. The capital flight is also being fueled by expectations that the U.S. Federal Reserve will decide to taper an additional 10 billion U.S. dollars off their bond buying programs during their two-day policy meeting that begins on Tuesday. Kim ji Arirang News. Well, check this out, Apple. Korean tech giant Samsung Electronics and Google have agreed on a global patent cross-licensing agreement. The new agreement will allow the two tech giants to share currently owned patents as well as any filed in the next 10 years. Our UDN reports. Samsung Electronics and Google, which are frequently involved in patent infringement lawsuits but not against each other, have agreed to share their existing patents and those filed over the next 10 years. Without providing details that two companies emphasized, the deal will help them better avoid litigation. The head of Samsung's intellectual property center, An Seung Ho, said in a press release that Samsung and Google are showing the rest of the industry that there is more to gain from cooperating than engaging in unnecessary patent disputes. The sentiment was echoed by Google's deputy general counsel for patents, Alan Lowe, who said through agreements like this, companies can reduce the potential for litigation and focus instead on innovation. The comments appear to have been a direct shot at Apple, with which the two companies have been engaged in a number of multinational patent battles. Samsung is the second largest patent holder in the United States, and Google is the 11th, and the deal is expected to give both an edge in upcoming patent battles. For Google, pundits say the deal has broad implications, considering its growing reach into hardware and wearables. With Samsung's hardware patent, Google can more easily expand into the wearable industry. Samsung, which seemed like it was trying to break away from Google's Android platform to develop a mobile platform of its own, will continue to work with Google in that realm. Looking ahead, the deal is also expected to lead to deeper collaboration on research and development of future projects. Yurian, Arirang News.
Time now to go over to our Kim Bogyang at the Weather Center for our weather checkup. Uh, it was a relatively, I would say, a warm, sunny day today and felt more like early spring than winter. So, Bogyang, can we expect more of the same tomorrow? Well, Kanyang, first, good to have you back. And the short answer to your question is no, because there looks to be light passing showers in the central regions tomorrow morning. So, it would be a good idea to keep an umbrella handy. Okay, uh, let's have some prophecy regarding the weather. How is the weather shaping up for the upcoming Lunar New Year holiday that begins Thursday? Well, Daniel, on and off showers are forecast over the Lunar New Year holiday. On Thursday, which is the first day of the holiday, it will be drizzly in most parts of the country. However, we should see clear skies on the day of the Lunar New Year, which is Friday. Well, tomorrow's temperatures will remain above the seasonal average range, with Seoul starting off the day at zero degrees with a high of four. Meanwhile, Daegu and Busan hit the low teens. Moving on to other regions, Jeju makes it to 11 degrees, while Dokdo and Mount Kumgang peak at 8 and minus 2 degrees, respectively. Well, that's all for now, and back to you guys. Thank you for that, Po Kyung, and that's all from us for this hour. This has been Daniel Chen. And I'm Moon Gan Young. Thank you, as always, for being here with us, and we will see you at the same time tomorrow. Good night.